Good afternoon. I'm so happy to welcome you all here today for our program, The Black Index, Archiving Black Creativity and Resistance. I'm Mary Miller, Director of the GRI, the Getty Research Institute. Here in Southern California, it's just afternoon where I am in my kitchen in Los Angeles on traditional Tongva and Gabrieleño lands. You, our audience today, are in many locations in snow and cold and sun. And you may be on other continents, other countries, many time zones, in Europe or the UK, perhaps down the block from me. We live in this pandemic more in the world than ever. And we seek to live in this world with awareness of where we are, who we are, and the power of the visual to bring understanding of the past into our present and future. The Getty launched the African American Art History Initiative in 2018 to establish a major center for the study of African American art history here on the West Coast. In just this short time, we have developed partnerships and programs, especially to secure archives and related original resources. And with a devoted librarian, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, whom you will meet shortly. You may have heard about the swift archival growth. The GRI is one of five institutions that acquired the over 4 million photographs of the Johnson Publishing Company, better known as the publishers of Ebony and Jet. And just a few months ago, the GRI with the School of Architecture of nearby University of Southern California acquired the archive of the most significant Black American architect of the 20th century, Paul Revere Williams, whose practice was focused in Southern California. We have annual research fellowships in the initiative and with residency that we so hope to return to in fall 21, as well as a program to conduct oral histories of notable African-American artists, scholars, critics, collectors, and art dealers. At every step of the way, we have benefited from the advice of senior scholars and the new partnerships that they have fostered, which leads us to today. We're so pleased to collaborate today with Bridget R. Cooks, who joins us from the University of California, Irvine, where she holds a dual faculty appointment in the program in African-American studies and the Department of Art History. We thank the University of California Humanities Research Institute for sharing this program. Professor Bridget Cook's work addresses African-American art and culture, black visual culture, museum criticism, film, feminist theory, and post-colonial theory. Her most recent book, Exhibiting Blackness, won the inaugural James A. Porter and David C. Driscoll Book Award in African-American art history. And she has acclaimed, she has received acclaim for her curatorial insights and her leadership. You will see why today. Bridget, I now turn this program over to you. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, and welcome everyone to our program, uh, The Black Index, Archiving Black Creativity and Resistance with bibliographer Simone Fujita and curator research librarian, Crystal Tribbett. I am Bridget Cooks and I'm curator of The Black Index. I'm excited to welcome you to this event presented in conjunction with the exhibition now on view at UC Irvine. I will echo Mary's uh, thanks in a few ways. Uh, first, it's wonderful to see audience members here from Spain, across the UK, Brazil, Argentina, Norway, Colombia, the Netherlands, Italy, Canada, France, and Sweden and dozens of cities in the United States. Thank you so much for uh, your time and your attention. And the silver lining in our remote situation is that you can join us here virtually in Southern California. For the past few years, I've worked with Sarah Watson, chief curator of the Hunter Art Galleries and the exhibition manager for the Black Index. I'm thankful for Sarah's collaboration on the exhibition. Thank you to the Black Index artists to artist professor and director of the University Art Gallery's Kevin Appel, Contemporary Art Center Gallery curator Allison Unzicker, 
and exhibition preparators Andrew McNeely and Tariq Garrett for their support with the exhibition at UCI. Thank you to the collaborative funders of this program, the UC Humanities Research Institute and the Getty Research Institute's African American Art History Initiative, with particular thanks to Mary Miller, Rebecca Peabody, Kelly Jones, and Laron Brooks for their support. A few words about the exhibition. The Black Index is an exhibition of work by six contemporary artists, Alicia Henry, Lava Thomas, Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle, Dennis Delgado, Titus Kafar, and Whitfield Lovell. Through their work, these artists build upon the tradition of Black self-representation as an antidote to colonialist images. The exhibition frames their art as a creative index, an alternative to the barrage of photographs of Black people who have been arrested, incarcerated, and who have died often by violent means. Through a variety of innovative approaches, each of the artists addresses the paradox of being Black in America, which is to be alive but have little social value. The artist's works focus on the resilience and beauty of Black people despite living in dire political and social conditions. Please find more information about the exhibition, including the interactive VR experience, related programs, national tour, and the breathing meditation provided by artist Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle at theblackindex.art, theblackindex.art. And pre-order information for the catalog is also located at that site. Now, I am thrilled to introduce our presenters to you for this program that I've been looking forward to for so long. Simone Fujita is an art librarian and archivist currently working as the bibliographer for African-American art at the Getty Research Institute. A native of Southern California, Simone studied art history and Asian Pacific American studies at NYU before obtaining a master's degree in library science at UCLA. While working at UCLA Special Collections, she processed the Soul Publications Incorporated records, an archival collection documenting the history of a Black-owned, Los Angeles-based music and culture magazine. Prior to the Getty, Simone was a librarian and outreach co coordinator at Art Center College of Design, where she diversified the library collection, taught library instruction courses, curated exhibitions, served as the center zine librarian, and created outreach initiatives in close collaboration with students of color, LGBTQIA students, and faculty artists. In her role as bibliographer at the GRI, she leads the Getty Library's collection development efforts for the African American Art History Initiative. In addition to expanding the print and electronic resources to support advanced research on African American art, she's creating a digital bibliography resource that captures recent media coverage of Black artists of the United States and the African diaspora. She looks forward to sharing the Getty's African American Art History Initiative resources with Black communities, both locally and nationally. Joining her is Dr. Crystal Trivet who is the curator for Orange County Regional Histories for the UC Irvine Libraries. Tribbett is especially focused on supporting the preservation of histories of underrepresented people and narratives of the region. She holds a doctorate in the history of science and science studies from UC San Diego, and she's an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow for Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage Rare, Rare Book School. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Trivet in my classroom for several years, where she has been an invaluable resource for teaching students about the importance of ethnic studies and creating archival collections with marginalized communities. She was also a key member of the Transforming Knowledge, Transforming Libraries project at UC Irvine that sought to bridge the gap between ethnic studies theory and community archives practice. Through this program, she helped recruit undergraduate students into opportunities for careers in libraries and archives. Both Fujita and Tribbett lead as examples in their field 
in which Black people are sorely underrepresented, especially now during a time where decolonized thinking is so key to the survival of Black life. We will have time for discussion with both speakers prompted by your questions in about half an hour. So please type your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen at any time. And this event is being recorded and will be available shortly on the Getty Research Institute YouTube channel. For now, please join me in welcoming Simone Fujita and Crystal Trivet. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'll be speaking for a few moments and then um, Crystal will also be speaking and then we'll go into a discussion between the two of us uh, before opening up for questions. Um, we just wanted to share a little bit more about our, um, our roles because I think that often archives and library and work is a little misunderstood. So, hi again, everybody. My name is Simone Fujita. I'm the bibliographer for African American art at the Getty Research Institute. Um, my work is one component of the African American Art History Initiative, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Um, and as Bridget said, I'm a librarian and archivist, although I'm currently working primarily as a librarian. Um, and I'm really honored that Bridget called us together for this event. Um, when we talk about art history, the people who are typically engaged in these conversations um, publicly are artists, scholars, and professors. Um, and it's a little <laughs> it's a little known fact, but actually there are many librarians and archivists who are also um, scholars, historians, and professors as well. Um, many of my library and archives colleagues at the Getty Research Institute have advanced degrees in art history um, and are scholars themselves, um, in addition to being archivists and librarians. So um, I, I think that because it's typically women's work and because there's still gendered notions about what a scholar looks like, also racialized notions about that. Um, I think that women's contributions, um, women who are archivists and librarians tend to be overlooked um, when evaluating their impact on art history. Um, so I'm really honored that Bridget gave this opportunity for us to share um, the ways that librarians and archivists are contributing to the preservation of Black art history. Um, when we think about the foundation of Black art history, um, you think about figures like Elaine Locke and James A. Porter, um, David Driscoll. I mean, obviously there's many others. This is not to minimize their contributions at all, but um, I also wanted to shine a light on some of the work of Black librarians in also setting the foundation for this type of work. Um, so Dorothy Porter is a librarian who is well known for, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, okay, anyway. Dorothy Porter was actually married to James Porter, um, but she was an acclaimed, like she was a scholar in her own right. She was a curator, historian, and she made a lot of interventions in our field that actually really fought against white supremacy. Um, and she also was one of the people behind the establishment of Howard's Moreland Spingard um, Research Center. Um, Also, Miriam Matthews, who was LA's first Black um, librarian um, for the LA Public Library System, um, was also a historian. And um, I also want to add, all these women were not just historians and researchers, but they also were collectors themselves. So, um, so Miriam Matthews and Mamie Clayton, in particular, they both established collections. Um, Mimi Clayton worked at UCLA and um, and 
was very instrumental in um, gathering her own personal collection of um, art and film ephemera and books and all kinds of materials. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of convey that there are these pioneering Black librarians who have done this work, um, who are sort of unsung heroes um, and un underrepresented in the historical record. And when I look at these women, I'm reminded of my colleagues um, in art librarianship, like Lori Salmon at NYU's Institute of Fine Art, um, Stacey Williams at USC's Art and Architecture Library, um, Megan Williams, formerly of the Schoenberg. Um, there's so many other amazing Black librarians in the field today who are doing important work. Carthy Berry, Carla Hayden, um, Tamar Evangelistia Doherty, um, Meredith Evans. There's many, so there's a lot to investigate there. I encourage everybody to look into that um, further. I'm not sure why this is, okay. Sorry, it was not advancing. Um, so to give you a little bit more background information on the African American Art History Initiative at the Getty Research Institute, um, the Getty Research Institute is a center for studying um, advanced art, or for engaging in advanced art historical research. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a place where um, we support the creation of new art historical knowledge. Um, and we're open for use by the public free of charge, but if you wanna be a researcher, you have to apply um, to get that status and then to be able to come in and use our resources, which obviously we can't do at the moment because of COVID. But when we reopen, I encourage you, if this sounds interesting to you, to um, consider signing up to be a researcher at the Getty Research Institute. Um, the, the Institute is establishing ourselves here with the initiative, um, not as the only site for Black art historical research. I just want to add that. Um, our goal here, as this quote from our, um, our website about the initiative states, is that our goal is to augment the efforts that have already been underway for some time. We recognize that we're not pioneers of African American art historical research, that there are many people and institutions that have come before us that have been doing this work for a long time. Um, but we do have resources and as Mary Miller had said that we're we're gathering um, archives so we have special collections in the work as well as the library collection that I'm helping to build so um, that's just a little bit more about how the initiative um, supports ongoing research in black art history you, I like to think about um, the work that we're doing as part of a larger ecosystem. We want a healthy ecosystem of um, that, an, a healthy research ecosystem nationally that supports Black art historical research. Um, it shouldn't just fall on one organization or site. Um, we need to have a variety of institutions doing important work. Um, so we're we're one of of several or many. <laughs> Um, and some of some of the the guiding principles that I have while I do the work of building the library collection um, are these thoughts right here that future art histories are being made now. Um, artist publications can be works of art and serve as critical art documentation, um, particularly with um, self-published works, and also the idea of art as archive. Um, so <laughs> working in a predominantly white institution like the Getty and also having studied art history um, myself in school, I remember being very frustrated by the limitations of the art historical canon. Um, so when I saw this tweet yesterday, I had to include it because I think that this summarizes the way that many people of color and black people 
um, particularly perhaps feel um, about canons. Um, so it's inspiring to me that I can help build a library collection that can inspire new canons, expanding the existing canon or just exploding it and starting a new canon or perhaps banishing canon. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the types of materials that I purchase as part of my work. Um, in addition to print materials, I acquire electronic resources, um, databases. I'm looking forward to starting an ephemera project. Um, I do a digital bibliography project that I'll um, speak about in a moment. Um, I'm really interested in incorporating self-published artist materials and zines. Um, and the scope is very broad. The types of things, it includes the types of things you would typically think about, drawing, painting, sculpture, architecture, um, these things that most people think of when they think about art. Uh, but it also incorporates dance, music, design, fashion, film, um, cultural history, um, documenting the work of artists and curators um, of African American art, but also the African diaspora, um, both past and present. Um, I know that a lot of institutions have the past very well covered and we do have a lot <laughs> relating to the foundations of art history and um, but but I also wanted to highlight here some of the newer publications that we've gotten um, covering contemporary artists like Lauren Halsey, um, Camila Janan Rashid, um, Antoine Sargent's great book, The New Black Vanguard, that incorporates the work of many artists, um, Black Futures by Kimberly True and Jenna Wortham, um, Old and Art School by Nell Painter, um, Legacy Russell's Glitch Feminism, and these sort of more self-published, smaller, um, see, independent published, not smaller, um, independent publications um, or self-published artist publications. So we have the wonderful Creative Black Women's Playbook by um, Veronica Ratliff, um, The Monumental Misrememberings by Mimi Tempest. Um, Cassandra Press is run by Candace Williams. Uh, so this is uh, an image from her double consciousness reader that she created. And then Martine Sims also runs an artist press, um, Domenica, and this is one of her publications. I just wanted to quickly talk about digital bibliography uh, before we hand it over to Crystal. Um, because databases tend to cover older materials, I mean, we have books that cover art history of the past. <laughs> that sounds silly. Um, and then we also have databases that typically cover, you know, there's like a moving wall of coverage. So it's not usually the current year. So I wanted a way to sort of, my archivist brain wanted a way to capture all the exciting um, things happening in black art history today. So in order to do that, I use Zotero as a platform and we're creating this digital bibliography platform um, or site that we will share publicly when it's ready. Um, and this is kind of um, collocating and documenting um, recent coverage from the last year or two on um, black artists, black curators, exhibitions, um, and sort of like the explosion of interest in African American art. So um, this is sort of a preview of what it looks like. Um, you can add tags to the content. And so if you look at this slide, my wonderful intern Eric Olson helped me um, with adding tags to many of these. And so if you look at this, you'll see here's these 21 tags indicate um, the contents of that article about Black queer owned brands. Um, so that there's metadata to support this. And then there's also another way of looking 
at the content in the digital bibliography. If you click on the tag for an artist or institution, um, it'll pull up the um, articles that we've saved um, that are recent coverage of that person or place or thing. Um, that's actually it for me, me now, and I'd like to hand it over to Crystal. Thank you so much, Simone, for that presentation. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Cooks, for um, the wonderful introduction. Um, I really would like to express my gratitude for you to you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Um, I'm truly humbled to be here. I'm excited to speak with Simone this afternoon. Uh, we briefly met in, in person in 2019 uh, through our associations with a rare book school course on developing African-American resources in special collections. Um, having the opportunity to talk about documenting and preserving the Black experience through archives is really exciting. As um, Dr. Cooks mentioned, I work in UCI Libraries, Special Collections and Archives as a curator. Um, this department houses the university's collections of rare books, manuscripts, photographs, ephemera, foreign digital files, and other unique materials. Our holdings include university archives, critical theory, performing arts, regional history, political literature, and a growing um, collection of artist books and so much more. Um, we serve the UCI campus, Orange County community, and researchers from across the nation and the world. Um, I don't wanna move forward in my presentation before acknowledging that I am uh, giving this presentation at UCI, which sits on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hotchman and Tongva peoples, past and present, um, people who have stewarded the land throughout generations. The Hotchman and Tongva tribes are active in Orange County and they continue to resist the occupation of their lands and the lack of federal recognition of their history and sovereignty in the region. Today, as we reflect on archiving Black creativity and resistance, I hope we remain mindful of the interconnectedness of people of color, um, people who are oppressed by systems that perpetuate anti-Blackness through maintenance of colonialist practices and products. Um, the history of archives is based in the practice of extraction. In the picking and choosing of things deemed rare and valuable and the keeping of these things for the benefit of some and the exclusion of others. Um, this history has had a lasting impression on what is preserved, how records are preserved, and who does the preservation work. Uh, when I first um, began working in archives, um, I recall reading and hearing a lot about the need to diversify the historical record in the archival profession. While it seemed new and exciting to many um, in the profession, at least that was kind of like the, what, it, what I sensed, um, as a Black person, this was not new news to me. I have experienced firsthand going into archives and um, libraries feeling out of place and not finding evidence of Black life, culture, beauty, activism, and you know, so on preserved, or finding things about Black people, but not by Black people. Um, today, I'm going to try to touch briefly on approaches to this dilemma at UCI. What are institutions like UCI um, um, to do when we recognize cultural gaps in our collecting? inadequate access to materials and mountains of mistrust that Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color have in the institution um, to do right by their histories. Some might suggest that the response is to do, um, to do more collecting, more targeted projects and initiatives. Um, I like to recognize the many, many archival scholars, librarians, community um, activists, um, and librarians like Burgess Jules, Jared Drake, um, the members of the Chicago-based Blackivist Collective, um, archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia and so many more for making it clear that it's not just about what you do, it's how you do it. Um, how do we support, preserve, and make accessible Black history and culture in ethically, morally responsible, transparent, and collaborative ways? Lael Hughes Watkins, University Archivist for the University of Maryland, who I also met through Rare Book School in California, has called for academic repositories to engage in reparative archival work. Um, she's written um, the, uh, the quote I have on the screen here. It says, reparative archival work does not pretend to ignore the imperialist, racist, um, homophobic, sexist, 
ableist and other discriminatory traditions of mainstream archives, but instead acknowledges these failures and engages in conscious actions towards the wholeness that may seem to be an exercise in futility, but is actually um, an ethical imperative for all within traditional archival spaces. Um, at UCI Special Collections and Archives, we are continually working towards exploring ways to do reparative archival work. Um, one way is through thoughtful acquisitions of materials um, that strengthen our collections um, and that also support local communities. Um, for example, um, I have um, just a few of the kinds of uh, collections that we have um, from my for example, my dear colleagues, um, Derek Kazada and former colleague Steve McLeod have sought out materials um, that can strengthen our political literature collection, especially um, materials that have documented Black resistance. Um, our political, collection, uh, political literature collection consists largely of ephemeral materials like pamphlets. Um, many of the pamphlets are from the late 70s and some examples of the materials we have are um, like Black Liberation Now, control, conflict, and change the underlying concepts of Black Manifesto, and People's News Service, which is um, a, a kind of newsletter, which is about the Black Panther Party in Southern California chapter. Um, we are also um, doing work um, in um, expanding and building our university archives, especially as it documents um, the student experience. Um, my colleague, um, Elvia Arroyo Ramirez, has been amazing in connecting with um, uh, our cross-cultural center and the various organizations housed there. Um, and really um, working to not just um, tell students, you know, to donate their materials to the archives, but um, really um, expressing um, uh, the importance of, of um, you know, archival, of, of records creation, right, of, um, of um, being, um, being both the um, records creator and the, um, and the records um, archivist. Um, she's had um, uh, served as an archivist in residence for the crops um, and has taught um, numerous workshops and she's doing really wonderful work. Um, I'd like to um, also highlight our zine collections, um, our commitment to collecting zines and holding um, zine making workshops is something we're very proud of. For those who do not know what a zine is, it's short for a magazine or fanzine, um, they're self-published small circulation booklets, um, pamphlets or flyers created to advance the views of the creator. Um, popular subjects include politics, music, um, uh, race and culture, social justice, gender and sexuality. Um, on this slide, I have um, an example of a zine that we um, acquired um, by attending Zine Fest on Orange County, um, which uh, promotes the, the zine culture in the region, um, creating connections between zinesters and encouraging artists and non-artists to discover zines. Um, I really um, like zines and um, think that they're a wonderful way to um, really um, teach um, not only college students, but members of our community um, about, um, again, records creation, that um, things that you find in archives, I think there's a, um, this kind of old thought that, oh, the, they're old materials, that they come from, you know, people of some kind of high authority, but to really turn that on its head and to say that any given person is a records creator and uh, any given person has the um, ability and the right to help to construct and, um, history. And that can be done in, um, in ways that are really creative in the process. Like zines are very simple. Um, you can just have nothing but a pencil and paper um, and your own thoughts and creativity. Our artist books collection is one of the most powerful collections we have in its ability to highlight Black resistance and content, but also Black creativity through artistic expression of ideas. Um, an artist book is, an, is art. Um, it uses the form or elements of a book for inspiration. 
every aspect of an artist's book um, from material used to the various ways to read the content help to convey the message to the reader. Um, on this slide, I have an example of an um, artist book, or it's technically not a, um, a book, but it's actually a page um, in, um, in our collection by Tia Blasangami. Um, and uh, it's titled Yvette's Purse. It's one piece of paper, um, letterpress print on handmade paper. Um, this work is expressing the need for justice for Yvette um, Henderson, um, who was a 30 year, 38 year old black woman who was shot um, and killed in Emeryville, California by police in 2015. Um, she was shot seven seconds after police arrived on the scene when re responding to reports from a Home Depot about an alleged theft. Um, the body cameras were turned off during the shooting um, and turned on after the shooting and surveillance footage was withheld from the public. Um, as the story unfolded, the public learned a vet um, had showed signs of a head injury received likely while in Home Depot. And so this poem is really um, captivating um, written in the shape of um, of a purse. Um, I'm gonna move on for the sake of um, time, but hopefully you got to read it. Um, another artist book that we have um, is uh, The Battle of and for Black Boy, uh, Black Face Boy. Um, it's an artist book um, by Curly R. Holton, which brings the poetry of Nikki Finney um, to life in a large book that folds like an accordion. Um, the poem by Finney was uh, featured, um, was uh, commissioned by the Clarence Smith Center at the University of Maryland in 2013 and commemorated the 150th anniversary of the Civil Wars. And um, Finney uh, worked on the poem around the time that George Zimmerman was found not guilty of Trayvon Martin's murder and around the time that Michael Brown was shot. Um, in the introduction, Finney wrote, um, I wanted to write a poem that traveled from the horror of one day to the lifting of our chins the next, that paid homage to how we keep moving, keep stepping forward, inventing whatever is next to invent, constructing, fashioning iron chains into wings, how we continue to fold and shape into the future, into a future what has been kept from us, regardless of the brutality that still chases us. Um, I think she was really successful in this work. Um, and so on the screen, we have a picture of a um, of black boy with flag. Uh, it's, it's on the cover of um, the artist book and, and shows up throughout the, um, throughout the book. Um, it's really um, powerful artist books to share um, with students. And um, what I, again, to reiterate what's really wonderful about artist books as um, kind of a teaching tool is that it um, really shows um, students how you can express um, your thoughts, your perspectives in really creative ways and you're not limited to um, you know, essays or articles or, or um, really traditional books that you can put forth all of your creativity in doing something that people can really resonate with. Um, so I'd like to um, kind of turn to um, a philosophy that we have really quickly um, that we use, especially when we're talking about um, not not just acquiring material from um, from booksellers or zinesters, <laughs> but um, also to working with our community. Um, as um, as I mentioned, I'm a curator for Orange County Regional History, so I do a lot of thinking about how to value community expertise and lived experience and really support um, the histories. Um, We've been um, taking what we consider a community-centered approach um, to working with um, communities. This was really um, an idea that was born out of work that um, my colleague Chuivo Dang has done in, in constructing and helping to support um, our Southeast Asian archive, but also in the work that um, uh, Dr. Bo Dang and Audra Eagle Yoon, Jimmy Zawal and I did um, on our grant Transforming Knowledge, Transforming Libraries, in which we um, looked at the intersection of ethnic studies and community-based archives. And um, 
wanting to articulate what a collaborative partnership with communities really looks like. Um, and here I have some of the main points on the screen. Um, it's about being attentive to inequities that are reflected in our archives, responsive to communities' needs, collaborative through shared authority, and cognizant of the divergent um, priorities of communities. Um, we really try to trust communities' expertise and, and lived experience as the impetus for building impactful community-centered archives. And that includes archives that we do not own um, or and will not own um, because perhaps we are not the right place um, to, to hold that material. So, I mean, there's really a question of how do we champion, champion records where they are? And by that, again, I mean, um, there are a lot of memory workers in Orange County and sometimes they exist in, in organizations whose function, um, you know, is multifaceted and not just on um, preserving history through archives. Um, and so when we think about the role um, that institutions can play in supporting these efforts, and we really have to think beyond what we have in our own possession and how to support, support our communities. One way to support, um, uh, we really explored through um, that grant that I mentioned previously, Transforming Knowledge, Transforming Libraries, um, in which we've worked with, um, with our student fellows who are part of that grant um, to um, connect with community organizations um, to help preserve, um, organize, identify their own records. One example um, was um, work that our interns did on the Harriet Tyler collection, which is at the Heritage Museum of Orange County, uh, which is dedicated to preserving, promoting, and restoring the heritage of Orange County. If you've not heard about it, you should look up um, the museum. They are doing um, phenomenal work. Um, and the collection, the Harriet Tyler collection, includes albums, scrapbooks, posters, documents, newspaper clippings that were all collected by um, an individual who was a, a real figurehead in the African American community um, in Santa Ana. Um, and um, the, the Heritage Museum does a lot of things um, and um, preserving materials is just one of them. They do a lot of educational um, work with schools and such. And so being able to, um, to work with students to help to do the organizing and, and descriptive work um, for this collection is a really powerful step towards helping to make it available to the public. Um, I'm going to stop here and so that we have a little time to talk, um, but I, I hope that gave you just a little taste of um, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Hi, Crystal. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was so wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's almost like, oh, we made it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so since we were going to ask each other a few questions, maybe I know we're probably running a little bit late, but <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to ask first. Or oh, I yeah, sure. I'm, I mean, um, you know, I have so many questions for you and I'm trying to pick like which one mm. I ask. Um, and um, I want to ask, um, you know, what are some of the challenges you think we face as black memory workers in, in doing the work of preserving black history? I feel like you really hit on some of them in your presentation, you know, um, the idea that ethically um, when we approach this work, not every institution is the best fit for a collection. I think that that's such an important point. Um, you know, champ I love the idea, like how you worded it, championing records where they are. Um, so finding ways to value different types of knowledge. You know, I talked a lot about scholarship and librarians and um, sort of degrees, <laughs> but um, I think it's also important to value that there are lots of memory workers that don't have degrees or might be in rural areas, um, not close to a large university or something like that. So there, are, you know, there's so many people, I mean, grandmothers, you know, being the, the memory workers for their families. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different types of knowledge um, that we need to 
value when we're approaching this work. Um, not just people with PhDs, but also, you know, regular people that know their communities, yeah. that know their families, histories. Um, yeah, so finding the right sites. I think also um, the idea of like democratizing our knowledge, <laughs> like our skill sets about preservation and just sharing that more widely with communities. Um, would really help um, to kind of broaden the reach of, of archival strategies that we use to preserve, um, you know, um, black culture and history and art. Um, but, but another challenge I think is, um, I think we talked about this a little bit is, um, and I'd love to hear what you have to say <laughs> about, um, you know, distrust that communities might have about working with um, larger institutions. Um, I, I do feel like, um, just to be candid, since um, the Getty entered this sort of uh, Black art history field a little bit on the later side compared with like HBCUs and many of like Studio Museum in Harlem and other, other places that had been doing this work. So I know, I just, know that people are thinking okay now are they thinking that they're going to just take over the field and mm -hmm. swoop up all the resources and um i think ethically that's not what we're trying to do but um but i think there needs to be a lot of communication for people to understand people's motivations and it's right to be um critical of institutions and it's right to ask hard questions and and to be suspicious, I think I think that's fair. Um, but I want to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, I'm like looking at my own question. I mean, what are what are some of the challenges? I, I think you hit some of the points, especially in in, in reiterating the idea of um, of overcoming. Um, uh, mistrust that um, not just the black community, but other um, mm -hmm. communities Definitely. of color and, and disenfranchised communities who have been left out of, you know, um, out of spaces, right? Um, mm -hmm. it, feeling like, you know, is this, or is this library, is this archive for me? And then going in and not being able to see things that really resonate with their own experience. And, you know, what do you make of that? You know, mm -hmm. you either think you are not valued um, and, and, or that your, you know, your stuff isn't considered important. And mm -hmm. so, so much of what, um, the work that, um, we've been doing at UCI, um, in, a, in our classrooms around primary source literacy is about kind of this basic, um, discussions about you, you know, you students, you, anybody are also creating history. You can contribute to history mm -hmm. just because, you know, for so long, perhaps we've been thinking about archives as old, you know, things by dominant pop, you know, white yeah. people, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that, that that's the stuff that's valuable. And that's just not the case. Um, um, and so, and, and even talking with organizations, um, what um, I find is kind of is, is finding myself saying like, no, those records are important because, you know, they're like, well, you know, who wants to see, you know, these pictures or who, you know, all we don't, we don't have any of the, you know, things signed, you know, signed autograph. And it's like, no, 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 that's not, um, I mean, those are valuable, but that's mm -hmm. not um, all that's valuable. And and your photos and scrapbooks are as valuable as anybody else's. And so overcoming that hurdle and then going mm -hmm. into the conversations about, um, oh, well, we didn't think it was valuable and we don't have it anymore, or we know it's valuable, but it's in like, you know, a box somewhere um, and we don't know what to do with it. Um, or we want to start this, we want to start doing this, how do we do it? Mm -hmm. So and having these conversations about um, the process of, of starting that kind of work um, is, is a, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge, but also really exciting. So I'm, I, I hate to Jessica. interrupt <laughs> because I think you guys are almost just getting started. Um, we have, <laughs> 
This could have have, been like three hours. (laughs) I know. And we have over 200 people that, you know, you have wrapped their attention. Um, We have some questions and I first just want to thank you and I'll thank you again for everything that you've you've shown. I feel like I can hear people taking notes all over the world, especially when you're showing the examples of zines and um, and artist books, which is just so Mm -hmm. important to do. Um, I also want to thank you both for using the term black memory workers. What an incredible term that I think opens up and allows people in, with different talents and skill sets to be part of the contribution of this whole discourse that we're talking about. So I feel like that was just like this aha moment. Um, and I'm really grateful to both of you um, for that. So. We have some really great questions, some conceptual questions, activist questions, and practical questions as as well. Um, We have lots of them now. So um, I'm gonna start with one um, from Beth uh, Maloney that picks up on what you were saying about mistrust and how big institutions can work with communities that don't necessarily have or do not have a legacy of trust and partnership um, with these large institutions. So she's asking about mistrust and asking what kinds of outreach efforts are effective to help make repairs between marginalized communities and institutions. Um, And I'm cognizant of time. So I wonder if if one or both of you could could sort of speak to that um, and then I'll I'll go on to the next questions. I sort of feel like Crystal would be better suited if she wants to answer it and then I can answer a different one just because she's doing archival acquisitions more than I am if you're comfortable with that crystal sure no problem um Mm -hmm. I think that you know overcoming the trust is a pro overcoming um mistrust is a process and it takes time and I think um what are the approaches? There is no one approach. I think for any given um, group of people, organizations, the first is to, to kind of reach out and to be really transparent about what your intentions are. That's really important to really try to outline, you know, this is why I'm speaking to you. This is why I value your perspective. And this is what I hope we can accomplish together. Um, I think the transparency is what's lacking a lot of times. Um, and so, that's a major um, um, part of doing the work. And I can't, again, say enough about it takes time. Some things take weeks, months, years to grow, um, to grow trust. And so there's a lot of patience. I think right now there's this feeling of, um, we need to do this now, we need to do this quickly, we need to do this fast, this is long overdue. And that's true, but there's been so many years um, where it has not been done or it has been done in really extractive um, ways um, that you can't undo that overnight. And so, um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers the question a little bit. I wish I had like, well, you need to do this, this and this. And, but I, I, I don't think that would be realistic mm-hmm. <laughs> to suggest. Yeah, I think that addresses the question. And there's labor that goes into this. It's not about just instantly things happen or to expect people to be grateful because you're interested, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We have some practical questions specifically for Simone. Um, One is about how can people access the um, Zotero um, bibliography that are putting together? there is commendations here. The work that you're doing is so important and questions about the technical choices you have to make. For example, what's the benefit of creating a digital bibliography in Zotero versus making a research guide? Um, Do you find that some digital resource types are better than others? And I'm also going to ask this question by Adrian Connolly, um, if you could talk more about the tags you used in the digital bibliography, how did you generate them? Um, And will they grow and accumulate as uh, people use the database? Okay, great. I'm happy to answer these questions. So um, we will make the digital bibliography public um, when it's ready, but we're still doing a lot of editing. We're constantly updating it. Um, By we, I mean me. (laughs) (laughs) So so that's um, one challenge but exciting thing because I love working on it. I had a wonderful intern last summer who did so much work and helped me um, 
So first I'll talk about the tags and then I'll go, because my intern Eric was very thoughtful about um, the work of tagging and, and thinking about how to um, thoughtfully apply metadata to these um, using terms that communities and artists created for themselves versus how they might appear in a Google search. Um, so I was really inspired by their work um, because this was something I didn't even consider when I said, okay, these are the things we need to do. And I, I think of myself as a critical cataloger and all these things, but I never thought about tagging in that way. So, um, so Eric actually went to like, beyond looking at the article, Eric would consult the internet and look at <laughs> um, Instagram accounts for these artists and see how they describe themselves and see the terms that they had in their profiles um, and make sure to use those rather than something that maybe a critic had applied to their work. So I thought that that was really important and um, a great uh, approach that they decided to use. And I think that that says a lot about the future. <laughs> this wonderful young um, college student was able to like really make that important decision for this project. Um, and as far as research guide versus Otero, um, we're actually doing a research guide as well. So I think the more digital tools, the better. I don't think that it has to be one or the other. So we're doing a, a digital, um, uh, we're doing a research guide, a library guide um, that will be up on the Getty Research Institute website when it's completed. And it will have a link to the digital bibliography. Right. Um, but just in the like nerdy, very like, like detailed oriented librarian way I'm gonna say that. If I used a research guide and I included, like we have actually, what I gave you on that slide was just a tiny preview. We have over 900 articles that are currently saved and I have a ton of other ones that I have bookmarked to be added. So we probably have like around 2000 articles. <laughs> so if I were to list those in a research guide, it would just, it would be very um, hard, unwieldy it would be hard to view and manage that way. So um, this is great because it allows us to, to add the additional tags. Um, I, I, I'll stop there because I could talk about this forever. No, that, I think that is a good direct answer. So I think that's helpful. Um, we have a question from Miguel de Baca. Um, I think both of you could um, contribute to this answer. How do you address the tension between an object focused or singular artist focused art history and the archives that serve it and the necessary focus and affirmation of communities involved in your work. So a shift from, you know, thinking about maybe, uh, you know, biography or, or telling a certain this person begat this person begat this person and then having a totally different focus where you're talking about community histories that also have individuals, but there's other stories to be told as well. Crystal or, or Simba. Yeah. You know, I don't know if there's a tension. I think that's what I'm, I'm grappling with with this mm -hmm. question is I, I don't think, I don't know that there is a tension or an either or approach here. I think it's a both um, that you can both um, really highlight an, an individual um, and you can do it, you know, on its own or within the context of the community. Um, and you can also talk about the keynote you know, community. I think what I'm, I'm curious about is what the relationship is between the community and, an, and a, a particular artist or something like that. Um, and that helps to really um, um, to, to build the context about, you know, where, where an artist comes from, where their thought process is, is being generated, how it's being generated. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see a, a tension. I like to think that both um, can be accomplished and should be accomplished. Okay, thank you. Um, other great questions. So Tom Norris is thanking you uh, for your work in today's presentation. Uh, with an exclamation point and asked if you're in contact with zine library curator Ziba Zadar Gazdecki. I'm sure smiling. we both are. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. 
or everyone else, if you're looking for another resource, she's at the Long Beach Public Library. So I'll say that and I'll go on. Um, Marsha Reed asks, what is the effect of dealers and auction houses on collecting black history? It's an increasingly hot market with prices inflating. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Ooh. I guess we both have takes on that. Um, uh, well, I think it's it's prohib it's cost prohibitive for a lot of smaller organizations and individuals who just might sincerely have an interest in this material. Obviously, like this cost inflation um, does not allow for these resources to be purchased by a variety of people, just the people with the most money um, in the market. So, um, so I think that that's really hard when you think about, yeah, smaller black run galleries or institutions or artist spaces or just collectors, personal collectors who have always been passionate about um, certain artists or you know, that are, are being pushed out of the market. That's my thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's great to see, you know, a value increasing monetarily, mm -hmm. even if they were always valuable and you can't put a price on that other kind of, of value to our understanding of culture. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I thoroughly agree that the, the challenge with the cost is that you are going to limit who has it and who can eventually have access to it, even as, you know, an institution like UCI, I and mean, we have limits too, um, just because of a larger, you know, academic institution. Some of these collections are incredibly costly that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's out of, you know, even some of the, the, the larger institutions budgets. And so that means that that material is sitting somewhere and people who want to access it cannot. Um, and so, and, you know, that's really a problem, I think. Um, and how to address that, that's tough. Um, yeah, that's tough. I, I would say um, if you're someone who's passionate about, about um, these artists and this work that you should support your local art zine maker. <laughs> because I think that these are like zines, I mean, like Crystal was saying, I'm really passionate about zines. I had, had um, really stewarded the zine collection at Art Center. And um, I, you know, they're, they're really important documentation that are created by an artist. Um, and right now it might be really reasonable so you can buy more of it and, <laughs> and really build up your library with, with original and um, small run zine publications if you're on a budget. <laughs> I will also say there's a great place um, in Los Angeles called Reparations Club on Washington mm -hmm. in the mid city area. And um, that institution is is doing a number of services in the in the community, but one is um, they collect and sell some of these materials that um, you're both um, interested in. So, okay, a few more questions. We're going to go over time just to try to to respond to all of these great questions. Howard Singerman, who um, is art history professor at uh, Hunter College and supporter of the Black Indus exhibition, asks. The black artists who emerged in the 1960s and 70s are now in their 80s and 90s. Some um, are known and so many are not. They have been their own archivists for decades. Um, how are decisions made in acquiring artists' papers? Can the Getty or other institutions support older artists organizationally or financially as they consider acquisitions? I just have a very quick answer before handing it over to Crystal to say that I'm not the person that makes the decisions about um, archival acquisitions, Lauren Brooks. My colleague is the curator for that. Um, but we are looking towards older artists and um, that's something that we're very um, aware of. And we've done some oral histories um, that you can find on YouTube, some of them on YouTube on our GRI channel um, with some older artists to capture these histories. 
Um, for us, I would say that um, we would always be interested in, in learning about um, the individuals, reaching out to them and talking to them about where they are in this process of preserving their own material. Um, we, uh, an academic institution um, like UCI, for our archival collections, we get them through donation, to be perfectly honest. And um, so that, uh, that, that process of acquiring through, you know, the, the kind heartedness of the, of the donor, it can be really prohibitive um, because you want to support the artist financially. You know, that's how they will, you know, survive. And yet there are, you know, um, barriers in place to allow us to do that to a certain extent, right? It's not necessarily impossible, but it's not very common or, you know, and so there's that sort of challenge, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I haven't had conversations with donors about here's who you can ask, you know, here is a list of people to ask, to reach out to you. Um, here's how you can, um, you know, kind of do this work on your own, how you, um, how do you preserve it in certain, you know, boxes out of what, you know, like, and that sort of thing. So there are still, there's still um, ways to support the work, even if you can't um, acquire it financially. And yeah. just one quick thing to add is like, I think that this issue that there's so many of these wonderful artists that are looking for a place to house their collection or their papers um, highlights the need for so many, like we all need to be doing this work in, in some sense because because it's not fair to have that burden just placed, not burden, I hate to say burden. The responsibility should not just lie with one or two institutions to capture these histories. We need it to be more evenly distributed so that we can capture more of them and preserve more stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I will also just say as one of the people who has the honor of doing some of these oral histories for the Getty, um, they are available to the public. Um, there, It's an ongoing process. Um, we're so fortunate to have uh, Laron Brooks as curator of collections, um, and he and he is making the decision in conversation with other people who are all part of the African American Art History Initiative. And so, it's not just one person that decides, but we're all bringing names to the table yeah. and discussing what's possible. Um, it's a really collaborative process, and then we do the oral histories with the UC Berkeley Oral History Center, which is a, a delight um, to do that. Okay, um, one more question. Okay, wow, this is hard. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, Kim Richter is asking a question um, and I will say we can take the questions that are here that we don't have time to answer now and send them to Simone and Crystal and they can respond um, so that people are, are getting responses even though we're running out of time. Kim Richter asks, how have you gone about your community work? How did you identify the community members? And how have you involved them in your institutions? Has this approach affected your work? Maybe both of mm -hmm. you probably have an answer to this. Um, my answer is probably quicker. So I'll go real quick and okay. say that, um, you know, my, my role at the GRI is relatively new and outreach is one of the things that I'm really interested in doing, but I haven't really had much chance to do outreach beyond reaching out to specific curators or uh, people that I know who um, I want to encourage to use the resources that we're building at the GRI um, and to tell people to spread the word and to tell students that I knew from Art Center and different, um, you know, one on one things, but I haven't been able to methodically approach a larger outreach um, process yet because um, my work is also new and I'm the only person who's doing the bibliography work. Mm -hmm. And I'd say um, we identify by kind of being aware of what's going on in the community, paying attention, making lists, um, and ha having students kind of create lists of organizations. Sometimes it's who you know, who you know, who you know, um, and connecting with um, with individuals and, and talking with them. How do we involve um, folks in, in our work is, um, I gave an example before, the Heritage Museum is reaching out, acknowledging what they are doing and being willing to support it. Um, 
even if it means that something's not coming to me, it's kind of like our goal is to preserve the history by any means necessary because I want it to be accessible to others. Um, so I'll stop there because I think we're running out of time. I know. Or we're out of time. <laughs> we are out of time. Um, I, I think that there are other conversations um, that people are having, you know, all over the world um, about Black Lives Matter, about Black representation. I know when I, it, when I invited both of you to be a part of this, you automatically were like, oh yeah, we've been already talking about this with this group and that group. Um, someone has also mentioned the Weeksville Heritage Society in Brooklyn doing great community education events um, that uh, we've been talking about here. So I just wanna say that out loud. Weeks build like days and months. Um, if you're interested in, in looking at what other people are doing just to support what you're saying about needing um, a lot of people to be involved to really get a good picture of resources. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, selfishly, I thank you for um, allowing me to um, help just facilitate a conversation between you. And I know that there's been so much interest around this conversation. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your, your skill set. Um, thank you to the Getty for providing this platform. Um, we had almost 500 people RSVP for today. And I think that just signals how important this moment is and how important you both are in, in this whole um, ongoing work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah. We appreciate <laughs> you. I appreciate you, Crystal. Same, Simone. <laughs> we have to talk some more. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to everyone who's listening. And again, this will be on the uh, GRI's YouTube page if you want to share it with others. Take care. Bye. Bye.